in order for Pokemon to advance in power, it has to evolve to another level. And each, e you know, evolution, he becomes more demonic in appearance. And eventually he gets to a point where he is totally demonic. Let us stand now, unbowed and unfettered by arcane doctrines born of fearful minds in darkened times. Let us embrace the Luciferian impulse to eat of the tree of knowledge and dissipate out blissful and comforting delusions of old. Let us demand that individuals be judged for their concrete actions, not their fealty to arbitrary social norms and illusory categorizations. Let us reason our solutions with agnosticism in all things, holding fast only to that which is demonstrably true. Let us stand firm against any and all arbitrary authority that threatens the personal sovereignty of one or all. That which will not bend must break, and that which can be destroyed by truth should never be spared its demise. It is done. Hail Satan. Pokemon is a children's video game, television show, and card game that has amassed an incredible following over the years. In fact, it's one of the largest grossing media franchises of all time, on no small part due to its ability to move merchandise. But when something gets this popular, you tend to attract your fair share of naysayers. Some people seem to live for hating things just because they're popular, and that's definitely a thing with Pokemon. But at the same time, we also see some more interesting accusations being made as well. It was just a couple months ago when I heard from a friend about this new game called Pokemon. It's apparently been all the rage recently, and I was thinking about getting it for my son, but being a good Christian man who wants to raise his kids in the way of the Lord, I just couldn't bring myself to buy it for him. Behind that colorful front is something truly evil. I quickly learned that the series is based around mastering and controlling, now get this, demons. Many of these creatures have supernatural powers. Some are psychic and others are literal ghosts. The article I read talked about a series of Pokemon named Abra, Kadabra, and Alakazam, which, if you didn't know, are magical incantations of heathen origin. Sure, this is all just pretend, it's just a story, but that's what they want you to think. One day, it's just pretend, the next your kid is going out to the woods to perform a satanic ritual in order to summon one of these dreadful demons. I heard that if you play one of the songs from the show backwards, you can hear the words, I love you, Satan. God forgive me for saying that. So this isn't just crazy talk, it's already happening. If that's not enough, then perhaps the presence of pagan beliefs from the Orient might be enough to sway you. What? That's racist, you say? I need to respect other people's beliefs? Well, everything has just gotten too PC these days. I was under the impression that this was a Christian nation, and we need all media to instill our children with a strong religious value. I mean, look at what they're teaching our kids in school these days. They're not saying that man was created, but evolved from apes. And these Pokemans, or whatever they're called, is pushing that narrative. We're at the point where now less than 20% of people believe in the biblical truth that Adam was created by God. Some say it's still as high as 40. Apparently that's due to a flawed methodology or something like that. I don't know and I don't really trust the polls anyways. But what remains true is that people are starting to reject the divine word of our Lord. And that is a serious problem. And it doesn't stop at that evolution crap either. I just saw on TV the other day that the show is pushing our children towards deviant lifestyles. Is nothing sacred anymore. You can't even turn on the TV these days without these people shoving that crap down our throats. We need to do something about this. Our entire way of life is under attack. I fear that it won't be long until we can't even say the word God anymore. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. So just about everything this um concerned citizen talked about is a real claim that was made by someone at some point. And yeah, most of them are quite ridiculous. Some of them aren't even original. The one about playing the poke rap backwards is just a rehash of claims that were levied against Led Zeppelin in the 1970s, to which the response from the record label at the time was, our turntables only play in one direction, forwards. Frontman Robert Plant later went on to add, to me it's very sad because 
Stairway to Heaven was written with the very best intention. And as far as reversing tapes and putting messages on the end, that's not my idea of making music. It's really sad. The first time I heard it was early in the morning when I was living at home, and I heard it on the news program. I was absolutely drained all day. I walked around and couldn't actually believe. I couldn't take people seriously who could come up with sketches like that. There are a lot of people who are making money there, and if that's the way they need to do it, then do it without my lyrics. I cherish them far too much. Like Plant, for many fans, the natural response when met with these claims is to try and fight them, to brush them off as ridiculous, or to try and refute them. But that's not always the best approach. Oftentimes, people who buy into conspiracy theories like this will engage in a form of circular thinking, where a lack of evidence becomes proof of the conspiracy theory. Debunk one claim, and multiple counterclaims will arise as to why the evidence isn't there. It's kind of like the game Whack-A-Mole, if you're familiar with that. Ian Danskin of Innuendo Studios does a good job of explaining this concept in action. It doesn't matter if these arguments are contradictory, because they're interchangeable. Disprove one, and it'll be swapped with another. This is how a conspiracy theory works, a theory supported by theories, where the value of a theory is not does it hold up to scrutiny, but does it lead to the pre-chosen conclusion. We can't trust these facts because we know journalists are liars. How do we know? Because of the evidence these facts would disprove. It's pointing and saying, you can't tell me it doesn't have legs. I know it has legs because it's a table and tables have legs where most people would say it's just a plank of wood. Basically, what I'm trying to get at here is that you can't really argue with these people. So I'm not going to. Instead, I want to try and get to the bottom of where exactly these claims come from, why these claims stick, explain why this kind of thinking is dangerous, and provide an alternative response that just might be effective in reframing the conversation. Ugh, the stupid scarf won't move. Okay, let's just... You know what? Screw it. Let's have it out in front. To begin our little quest, it might be best to explain where exactly this idea of Satan and Satanists come from. Satan is a Hebrew word that roughly translates to accuser, and is used numerous times throughout the Hebrew Bible, mostly in reference to human characters. The term is later used to refer to more supernatural entities in two locations once in the book of Job, and again in the book of Zechariah. But in both cases, the character is more akin to an angel than an enemy of God. According to psychologist and rabbi Adner Weiss, Judaism found the notion of God having to share authority as limiting the omnipotence and even the omniscience of God. And therefore, Satan was never personified as a source of evil that was equally powerful. The shift to the version we know today was actually an invention of early Christian thinkers, with the associations with the snake in the Garden of Eden and the character of Lucifer being more of a retcon of sorts. The concept of Satanism, this idea that people were out there worshipping the ultimate lord of evil, took root during the Middle Ages. Initially, while there was a belief in the supernatural, the idea was rejected by church scholars, but eventually took hold in the 1400s, with new claims of witches holding satanic rituals which led way for the witch hunts. Eventually, a couple hundred years and 50,000 dead, mostly women, the hysteria died down and rationality, it seems, had won. However, starting in the early 20th century, the idea started to slowly creep its way back into the conversation. There were rumblings that started in the 1960s and 1970s, but it really took off in the year 1980, with the publication of a book called Michelle Remembers, written by a psychiatrist named Lawrence Pazder. It centers around a woman named Michelle Smith, a patient Pazder had been seeing for years. During their sessions, she would claim that she needed to tell him something, but wasn't quite exactly sure what it was. So, in order to try and help her figure out what it was, over a 14-month period, Pazder performed hundreds of hours of hypnosis, during which she supposedly relived memories going back to when she was five years old and what she claimed was horrifying. In his book, Dangerous Games, Texas State professor Joseph Laycock claims that Smith alleged that her mother had been part of a satanic cult that had tortured her extensively. She'd been forced to assist in murders and infanticide. She had been confined within an enormous effigy of Satan. Her teeth had been removed, 
and horns and a tail had been surgically grafted onto her body. She had also witnessed the assemblage and animation of a Frankenstein-like monster, and met Satan himself, whose return to Earth was prevented when Smith resisted her family's satanic conjuring ritual. Following this disturbing revelation, something interesting happened. All of a sudden, other people came forward alleging the same thing had happened to them. Eventually, it received a name. Satanic Ritual Abuse, or SRA for short. Apparently, the phenomenon grew to the point where Laycock notes that autobiographies of SRA became kind of a genre. Now, let's state the obvious here. There is no evidence to substantiate any of these allegations. The type of recovered memory therapy used by Pazder has been largely discredited. It turns out that human memory is not super reliable, and ideas can be supplanted into one's head super easily. Furthermore, out of the 12,000 allegations of satanic ritual abuse made, not one was ever substantiated by any investigations conducted by law enforcement. Unfortunately, by the time this evidence had come to light, it was too little too late. First, as we already established, those who attach themselves most strongly to these allegations will only see this lack of evidence as proof that it was covered up by whatever nebulous conspiracy network they think is out to destroy their way of life. But also, the initial reporting did very little to assuage these concerns, as typically happens with moral panic. Expert on moral panic, Stanley Cohen explains that a key component of many of these incidents is the wild exaggeration of the problem. This includes the frequent usage of misleading headlines, particularly ones that do not match the contents of the article, and the repetition of false stories even after they had been debunked by other outlets. In some cases, reporting would simply cover unsubstantiated rumors. In effect, the constant pursuit of profit warped the norms of journalistic ethics in a frantic attempt to attract readers. But that doesn't quite answer the question as to why the public was so receptive to this idea. It seems like something that is so patently absurd that there's no way it could possibly be believed. Part of it is this backdrop of concern about the reality of mind control and cults brainwashing people a decade earlier, to which this seems like somewhat of a smoking gun for those concerns. On top of that, there were certain economic factors that contributed to it. This was a time when women were starting to enter the workforce, and now many parents were forced to find other people to take care of their kids while they were at work. And so now you have this concern. What exactly are these strangers teaching our kids? It's the same thing that feeds the hysteria over school curriculums every year in our present day. They fear that someone might teach their children something contrary to how they see the world. As Laycock put it, Many Americans truly did feel the presence of an invisible force that seemed to be all around them, corrupting their children and undermining the values of family. This anxiety was expressed in symbolic terms, and these symbols were then mistaken for reality. So that leads us to the next question. Where does Pokemon and gaming more broadly fit into this whole picture? Tragedy has a strange way of creating unexpected outcomes. The dead can't speak, but those left behind can give them a voice that they never had. Dallas Egbert was a 16-year-old student attending Michigan State University in the year 1979, one year prior to the publication of Michelle Remembers. By all measures, Dallas was considered a prodigy, far more intelligent than most other boys his age. He was the perfect son that any parent could ask for. And then something happened. On August 15th, Dallas disappeared without warning, with no indication as to where he might have gone, with the exception of a note found in his dorm room that read, to whom it may concern, should my body be found, I wish it to be cremated. Obviously distraught over the disappearance of their son and with no real leads to go off of, Dallas's parents offered a $5,000 reward for any information that could be used to help track him down. A week later, after finding nothing, Dallas's uncle ended up hiring a private investigator, a man by the name of William Deere. Deere is a bit of an interesting figure in all this. 
The man clearly thought very highly of himself, seeking to establish himself as a famous detective of sorts. Laycock describes the man as having presented himself as a larger-than-life figure and sometimes demonstrated narcissistic characteristics. The big thing about Dear to Note, however, is the way in which he helped shape the narrative about Dallas's disappearance. When looking for an explanation as to why Dallas just up and vanished like that, he honed in on a very specific detail. Dallas played a little game called Dungeons and Dragons. Quickly from there, he spun an elaborate story about how Dallas had been lost in the world of the game and delusionally thought that he was the character he played as. Over the course of the next month, the story grew and Deer's focus on this one game became a major component of the story. Laycock put it that Dallas's month-long disappearance was more than enough time to create a story about the dangers of D&D. However, like with Michelle Remembers, that's not actually what happened. In fact, Dallas barely played D&D at all. He had an interest in the game, sure, but he never participated in any games while he was attending Michigan State. He did, however, have a number of social, emotional, and mental issues, including depression and social isolation, a parental pressure to succeed, drug addiction, and allegedly he was gay and was struggling to come to terms with his sexuality. All of which are significantly more plausible explanations than Deer's story about Dungeons and Dragons. So what did happen during the month that he was gone? On the day that Dallas left the note in his room, he entered the steam tunnels under the university and attempted to overdose, which failed. He then stayed at a friend's house and then traveled around staying with acquaintances, many of whom he'd met through the gay community, none of whom wanted to shelter him for any extended period of time due to the intense media coverage of the story. Eventually, he made it all the way down to New Orleans, where he took cyanide pills which, once again, failed to kill him, at which point he then revealed his location and was picked up by deer in Morgan City, Louisiana, on September 13th. Unfortunately, as you might expect, this story doesn't end happily. Dallas died in 1980 by self-inflicted gunshot wound, an event that Laycock speculates might have been partially motivated by the fact that he was outed as gay by the media, something that he called a lapse of journalistic ethics. After all this had happened, things did not return to normal. The narrative about D&D causing you to lose yourself in the fantasy would not die. This was further intensified in 1984, when Deer, in contrast to statements made after Dallas's death about not revealing what had transpired during his investigation, published a book entitled The Dungeon Master. In it, he alleged that Dallas had played the role of the Dungeon Master in a real-life game of D&D leaving clues behind for someone to piece together and find him. He came to this conclusion by focusing on a corkboard found in Dallas's room and noticed that some of the pins vaguely resembled the shape of a handgun, to which he claims he was later told by Dallas pointed to the tunnel where he attempted to overdose that night. Laycock, however, remains skeptical of Deer, claiming, while this story could be true, it seems more likely that Deer obsessed over a mundane and irrelevant detail, and then avoided embarrassment by fabricating the confirmation after Dallas's death. Regardless of that, it's very clear that Deer was sold on this idea, as indicated by this passage from his book. It occurred to me that Dallas had been, in a way, a dungeon master. By disappearing, leaving clues, and setting up alternative outcomes for his adventure, he had created a game in which the other adventurers, me and my men, his parents, anyone who was involved, never knew what to expect. It didn't just end at that either. As part of his investigation, Deer did what he could to try and understand this game that he deemed so dangerous. This included, and I am not making this up, paying college students to play the game with him in his hotel room. Something that I can only imagine was extremely unpleasant for everyone involved. After that experience, he later came to lay forth the claim that being in the tunnels under the university was just like playing the game. Being in the tunnel 
was really similar to that game of Dungeons and Dragons I had played in my motel room. For me, that game had been exciting enough because my imagination is a good one. But maybe if I played the game more, I would have wanted more. These tunnels were practically guaranteed to set your imagination racing, but you didn't need an imagination down here. Based off of all of this, Lakecock comes to the conclusion that it was not Dallas, but Deer who had started to get lost in the fantasy. He began to reinterpret the story to fit the way he wanted to see himself, providing details designed to make him out to be the hero, saving this vulnerable young boy from the clutches of this evil game. And it worked. As Laycock remarks, the sensation created by Deer and his book had a number of lasting consequences. This story had inadvertently served as a massive marketing campaign for D&D. However, critics of D&D took Deer's story quite seriously. The Dungeon Master produced a vivid depiction of what a delusional gamer would look like. The Dungeon Master produced a vivid depiction of what a delusional gamer would look like if Dallas had, in fact, been one. In this sense, Deer allowed the media and his readers to know of the psychological dangers of D&D. They could vividly imagine the stages that led from enjoying a game of D&D to a complete break from reality. Following the Dallas incident, as we'll call it, we saw the story continue to be perpetuated. In 1981, author Rona J published a novel entitled Mazes and Monsters, which leaned in hard on the narrative that fantasy role-playing games are inherently dangerous. In more recent years, we saw this idea take the form of season three of the show Riverdale, which borrows heavily from the story we discussed above. So, in some capacity, these stories never went away. In addition, the nature of the so-called victims of this game played a role. Both Dallas and Irving Pulling, the 16-year-old son of prominent D&D critic Patricia Pulling, both were fairly bright young men from upper middle class families who both ended up taking their own lives. They had the whole world ahead of them. What could possibly have gone wrong if not for some corrupting outside influence? Something that, in both cases, could easily be attributed to the game of D&D. In fact, the reason gamers were singled out to begin with was because they were perceived as being more intelligent and more prone to be seduced by the game leading them to ultimately lose themselves in the fantasy. Now, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but there really isn't any evidence to support the premise that gamers have higher intelligence than the general population. So how did this start then? Well, according to Laycock, it had something to do with how some families, like the two mentioned earlier, were trying to make sense of the death of their children. In the years following Dallas' suicide, several other young men from affluent white families took their own lives including the son of Patricia Pulling. The families were left with a paradox. They believed their sons to be gifted and bound for success, and yet their sons had taken their own lives. Uh, furthermore, according to the theories of Miller and others, if a gifted child did commit suicide, it was the parents who were most likely to blame. The narrative of a deviant game that specifically targeted gifted young men and drove them mad helped to render this paradox sensible. In some cases, it may have also shielded parents from feelings of guilt. Finally, because families like the Egberts and Pullings were white and privileged, far more media attention was directed towards these suicides, causing a handful of cases to appear as an epidemic. And so now this, along with numerous cases of young players who also happened to commit horrible crimes, the stage was set for a moral panic. We have concerns over a potentially dangerous hobby and wild claims of satanic rituals being performed on children. It was only a matter of time before these two would start to intersect. So now that brings us to the next question. Why did a very specific subset of the Christian population have such an adverse reaction to this game and others like Pokemon? So concerns over and wishing to ban certain media forms have existed forever, and have in some cases been justified on moral grounds. The Greek philosopher Plato actually wanted to ban almost all plays and myths, effectively anything that depicted the gods as acting in a way that might set a bad example for the citizenry. Which is kind of funny because of how Plato wrote all of his dialogues, 
There's just something a bit ironic about Socrates being depicted raising concerns about corrupting the youth. So let's get the obvious thing out of the way first. There is absolutely no contradiction between liking fantasy and being a good Christian. Both the fathers of modern fantasy, J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis were men of profound faith, and they often utilized Christian imagery in their works. The same is true of Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, the creators of Dungeons & Dragons, both of whom were Christian. The game material for D&D, beyond borrowing heavily from Tolkien, also had its fair share of Christian influence on the mythology of the world. However, that did very little to dissuade people. In fact, it's not uncommon for people to engage in a form of special pleading that absolves Tolkien and Lewis of the crimes they attribute to just about every other fantasy author. The way they do this in the case of D&D is interesting. Similar to Plato, part of the reason D&D is so heavily despised is the way in which it is thought to corrupt the youth. According to John Ackerberg and John Weldon, the difference is one of morals. The stories of Lord of the Rings and the Chronicles of Narnia are ones that have clear lines between good and evil where good wins out in the end. This cannot be said of a game like D&D, which is a lot more freeform and gives players the agency to play an evil character if they so desire. Although granted, chaotic evil campaigns are fun for like all of two seconds. They basically all go the same way where you end up destroying the world in the end. In fact, all three evil alignments are the least popular ones for people to play as. However, this is actually something that Laycock focuses on. Not the chaotic evil thing, but the ability to make moral choices in the game. He writes, D&D is a reflection of the moral world of the players and provides the players with an opportunity to reflect on morality. From an ideological perspective, such moments of reflection are dangerous because they cannot be controlled. Once players are able to mentally step into the realm of play and anti-structure, there is no way to predict what new structure they might conceive. A big part of why this presents such an issue is that part of playing any alignment is determining what good and evil actually are. You need to intuit what those words mean and what the actions of a character of any given alignment would be. However, it looks like players don't quite like being told what exactly those words mean, as both lawful good and lawful neutral are towards the bottom of the alignment totem pole. In fact, the three most popular alignments are the ones in which players are afforded the most freedom in making moral judgment. People just don't want to always play as the goody two-shoes character because that's just not that fun all the time. You always end up playing as the hero of legend who saves the world from some evil sorcerer or demon or something like that. Wouldn't you rather play as the gallivanting rogue who challenges the corrupt people in power and seeks to set the world right? However, how does this move from the world of role-playing games to more static fantasy worlds? One where much less agency is allowed. Franchises like Pokemon and Harry Potter are cases of backlash being directed towards stories where good typically triumphs over evil. I mean, it's not like the game lets you actually join Team Rocket or anything. It would seem that there is something else at play here something that causes people to not allow pretend to just be pretend. According to Laycock, the answer lies in the rise of biblical literalism. Back in the 1980s, when the panic first started, 40% of Americans proclaimed that they believed that the Bible was the literal word of God. And sure, those numbers have fallen a bit, with data from 2011 putting it at a lower, but still quite high 30%. Now, let's be clear here. This is not something that people have always believed. This idea that the Bible is 100% factual is actually a modern invention, a response to claims put forth by others that the Bible is a myth, which given the way that we tend to understand the term can be seen as saying that the Bible is not true, which if we're talking from a historical and scientific perspective, it's not. However, the Bible can still be true even if we accept that premise. For most of history, the Bible was interpreted as having multiple meanings, with the key interpretation being that the text can be simultaneously fictitious in nature, but also deeply true in a metaphorical sense. It was never meant to be read as a history. The way you approach Genesis, for instance, is not the same way you'd approach a book about World War II. To draw upon a secular example of how things can be literally false, but metaphorically onto something, 
I want to look at the historic Stonewall Riot. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the narrative that you tend to see when people talk about this story is that the gay rights movement was started on June 28th, 1969 at a beloved gay bar called the Stonewall Inn when a black trans woman named Marsha P. Johnson threw the first brick at a police car leading to a standoff between patrons and police. And the rest was history. Except the fact that virtually everything I just said is not factual. Writing for the New York Times, journalist Shane O'Neill breaks down a lot of these misconceptions. While Stonewall was certainly a linchpin moment for queer rights, there were movements that existed beforehand. It wasn't born so much as it took its modern form on that night. In terms of the reputation of the establishment, many people who were there that night all seem to agree that it was a pretty trashy establishment. One that was run by the Mafia, no less. And what about how it started? Was it a brick that was thrown? Or maybe a bottle? Hell, it might have just been a rock. Ultimately, we don't know for sure. In terms of who started it, it wasn't Johnson, as by her own admission, she didn't even get there until 2 a.m. after the riots had started and the building was on fire. It has also sometimes been attributed to Johnson's close friend, Sylvia Rivera, no relation to prominent satanic panicker, Geraldo Rivera. But again, there is no evidence to support this and even her own statements on the matter have been inconsistent. According to eyewitness accounts, what is the most likely thing to have happened was that it wasn't a brick being thrown, but more so a scuffle between a police officer and a butch lesbian, who has sometimes been identified as Stormy Delarvier, but her admissions are mixed, and there is no conclusive proof that it was her. However, if you go on social media, every June you end up seeing memes like this. So clearly, despite how easy it is to find the truth, the narrative that's being shared seems to mean something to people, otherwise they wouldn't be sharing it. Even if the story itself is untrue, it gets to some deeper point about the gay community and the gay rights movement. Usually, the context for this, particularly the thing about Marsha P. Johnson, is that oftentimes trans people and people of color can be sidelined when talking about LGBT issues. And this is a bit of an attempt to push back on that tendency. It can also be used to highlight the actual, real contributions made by both Johnson and Rivera in the gay liberation movement. In fact, even the truth can have some utility, as gay men dominate a lot of gay spaces right now. So highlighting her role could be used to emphasize that lesbians are welcome as well. Now, that's all well and good, but this isn't without its downfalls. I mean, there were some individual people of color, but it was not a a group of trans people of color who started the writing. If, if people start telling stories, not as they were, but as they would like them to be, that procedure can be used by anybody for any purpose. So I think that we need to be consistent in the truth. Beyond being what we would typically call misinformation, it can unintentionally end up deifying these people as it puts them on a bit of a pedestal and can lead to a bunch of pointless squabbling. Just like those who take the Bible literally, we can get so bogged down in the weeds that we completely miss the broader point. It doesn't matter who started the riots or how they started, but rather it's the event itself that is significant. Similarly, it doesn't matter if God created the world in exactly seven days or if it happened 6,000 years ago. It also doesn't matter where Jesus was born or how long the Israelites wandered the desert. Getting so defensive towards any scientific or archeological evidence that contradicts these stories is completely missing the point. By refusing to engage critically with the text, no less one that was not originally written in English under completely different socio-political circumstances, and to assume that the meaning can be gleaned from just a surface level reading of the text is peak anti-intellectualism and shows a major discomfort with challenging one's own worldview. However, intellectual laziness is not quite the only explanation as to what's going on here. Another part of this has to do with the history of the Enlightenment and the way in which it sort of set the stage for these ideas to take hold. In effect, the emphasis by many Enlightenment thinkers on reason and empirical evidence left many Christian theologians on the defensive, 
and unable to properly respond to challenges without trying to prove the Bible was empirically true. They could argue that it was just a metaphor, a text designed to impart lessons on morals and the nature of God, but that wasn't quite an apt response because critics had already been dismissing the idea of fictional narratives as having any value to begin with. In the 1800s, there was a lot of pushback towards a new form of fictional media that had just debuted, the novel. One such critic was American President Thomas Jefferson, who had this to say, a great obstacle to good education is the ordinate passion prevalent for novels and the time lost in reading, which should be instructively deployed. When this poison enters the mind, it destroys its tone and revolts it against wholesome reading. Reason and fact, plain and unadored, are rejected. Nothing can engage attention unless dressed in all the figments of fancy, and nothing so bedecked comes amiss. The result is a bloated imagination, sickly judgment, and disgust towards all the real businesses of life. That sound familiar? Does it sound like any of the claims that we all used to hear that video games and action movies make you violent? But moreover, the important thing to note is that Jefferson seems to have a real issue with the fact that people are seeking out fictional narratives for enjoyment rather than reading something more serious. When you consider this, and you start to see how even as this idea was rejected, thankfully, that it seems that there were lasting effects on how some came to see the world. If fictional things have no value, and the Bible does have value, then the only logical conclusion is that the Bible isn't fictional, and therefore literally true. This created a problem, according to Laycock, when the idea of fantasy worlds entered the mix. He writes, their program of truth left them ill-equipped to think about how an idea could be both fictional and meaningful. The meaning, worlds created through imagination and fantasy, unless explicitly framed as Christian, appeared threatening. Lacking a sense of mythos, these critics were predisposed to interpret fantasy as pathology, propaganda, or the demonic. Essentially, left unable to properly defend their beliefs from criticism, people allowed the walls between reality and fantasy to collapse. It was not the players who got lost in the fantasy, but the critics who did. People like William Deere, Patricia Pulling, and Geraldo Rivera constructed worlds as vivid as the ones that can be found in any D&D campaign, and began to confuse that with reality. And by the way, what is the rapture uh, besides, like, genocidal ideation? Oh yeah, dude, we're right about religion. I can't wait for God to come back and commit all of you to eternal misery and suffering, and then he elevates us. I mean, really, the rapture is just like the ideation of genocidal intent, except it's being done by a supernatural force rather than being done by, rather than being done by like political agents. Does that make it better? I mean, that's kind of weird. Yeah, I don't like that. I'm not a fan of that. So on the surface, satanic narratives look ridiculous. A cursory glance makes it look like it's mostly just a bunch of stupid people who believe in magic and that things like Pokemon and Harry Potter are instruction manuals of sorts. However, there's a bit more to this. Broadly speaking, the concept of Satanism has been used throughout history as a means to other certain groups of people. Earlier we talked about the witch hunts, but beyond that, there have been some other groups that have been met with the same accusations. Heretics, for instance, were another group that were accused by early Christian theologians as worshipping the Lord of Evil himself, which is curious. While the church generally viewed so-called pagan deities as being demons, they thought that the people who worshipped them were misguided and not so much actively evil. So it seems like the accusations were being used as a cudgel to silence dissident and protect the church from those who sought to challenge its authority. Similarly, in the 1970s, during the height of the Cold War, a Romanian preacher named Richard Wormbrand made the claim that Karl Marx was a Satanist. Again, a useful tool to be used to paint an entire political ideology as being purely evil. In fact, it can often be easier to just accuse someone who spouts a specific viewpoint as being evil. Because if you can convince people that they're in communion with the devil, then you can get them to dismiss the idea without having to actually engage with the arguments directly. But it's not just political dissidents that have been accused of this. In 2018, a pastor in Ghana made this claim. You see, the, the homosexuals, are most of them are the satanists. And they control the economy of a nation. They have money. 
put a pin in that claim about controlling the economy. We'll get back to that in a second. So based on everything we've discussed so far, we've seen accusations of Satanism being thrown at a variety of different groups. In the case of some of these, the ramifications seem to just be that their attempts to limit the range of acceptable art, which is still bad, don't get me wrong, but some of the other groups that are targeted can be truly damaging. For example, targeting certain people for their views can be dangerous to the functioning of a free society. And in the case of those where the claim is levied against traits that cannot be changed, can be the prelude for something far, far worse. However, the truly sinister element lies a bit more beneath the surface and kind of ties all of these disparate groups together in a sense. Like with other conspiracy theories, these satanic narratives also come with this idea of a shadowy cabal manipulating things behind the scenes. And if you know a thing or two about history, then you know that that notion carries some very, very dangerous implications. I stated before that this whole thing really started in earnest with the allegations of satanic ritual abuse that started in the 1980s, but that idea was not created there. In fact, it's been around for literal centuries. Before Michelle Smith, there was William of Norwich, an English boy whose body was found dead in the woods in 1144. What presumably was an accident transformed into something truly sinister. The narrative quickly became that he was the sacrifice in an evil ritual performed by Jews in order to mock the passion of the Christ. That wasn't an isolated incident either. A monk named Theobald, a former Jew who later converted to Christianity, claimed that it was part of a larger plot. He verily told us in the ancient writings of his fathers it was written that the Jews, without the shedding of human blood, could neither obtain their freedom, nor could they ever return to their fatherland. Hence it was laid down by them in ancient times that every year they must sacrifice a Christian in some part of the world to the most high God in scorn and contempt of Christ, so that they might avenge their sufferings on him. This story quickly grew and became what was known as blood libel, and was used to justify the torture and execution of Jews throughout Europe, and unleashed a wave of anti-Semitism that culminated in one of the worst human rights atrocities to ever be committed. Both claims of satanic ritual abuse and the QAnon conspiracy theory, which is in many ways the spiritual successor to the satanic panic, play on anti-Semitic tropes, and we cannot ignore that. It was recently found that roughly half of QAnon believers agree with views exposed in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a deeply anti-Semitic text that was used as the justification for the final solution. This is what's at stake here. Beyond that, many of the other groups targeted by these accusations are usually drawn into the claims of the Jewish conspiracy. Essentially, for those who hold explicitly white supremacist views, the Jewish people are a necessary tool in constructing their mythology. According to scholar and activist Eric K. Ward, the successes of the civil rights movement created a terrible problem for white supremacist ideology. White supremacism, inscribed de jure by the Jim Crow regime and upheld de facto outside the South, had been the law of the land and a black-led social movement had toppled the political regime that supported it. How could a race of inferiors have unseated this power structure through organizing alone? For that matter, how could feminists and LGBTQ people have upended traditional gender relations? Leftists mounted a challenge to global capitalism. Muslims won billions of converts to Islam. How could you explain the boundary-crossing allure of hip-hop? The election of a black president? Some secret cabal? some mythological power must be manipulating the social order behind the scenes. This diabolical evil must control television, banking, entertainment, education, and even Washington, D.C. It must be brainwashing white people, rendering them racially unconscious. And that's where fantasy games can be drawn into this as well. Because if these things are part of the plot to lure children towards Satan, it's not hard to make the switch and then claim that they're part of a plot by Jews to destroy the West. It's effectively the same logic, 
but with different perpetrators. And if you think that that's just crazy speculation, then let me ask you this. Whatever happened to flat earthers? Why does it seem like they're less prevalent all of a sudden? As YouTuber Dan Olson points out, it's because many of them jumped ship over to QAnon. And that's the problem. People who believe in one conspiracy theory tend to believe them all. So things like thinking the earth is flat or that the moon landing was faked may seem harmless, but the reality is that those people probably believe in something potentially more dangerous as they rely on the same base set of assumptions as the more dangerous conspiracy theories. Namely, the fact that there is some secret group that is responsible for the conspiracy. So the thing that's extremely important here is to be aware of these narratives and the talking points that have more sinister implications. Because it's way easier to reach someone who thinks the moon landing was fake, or that Pokemon encourages you to commune with demons, than it is to argue with someone who has gone full in on the anti-Semitism because once they get there, that's where these ideas transform from harmless and stupid to genocidal in their aims and intentions. So now that we've established why this problem is so particularly dangerous, allow us to return to the topic at hand and formulate a way in which these narratives can be appropriately challenged and perhaps even stripped of their power. In 2009, the Oklahoma State Legislature passed a bill approving the construction of an effigy containing the Ten Commandments on the grounds of the state capitol. Now, let's start with the obvious thing here. This is very illegal, as it signals preference towards a particular religion, which can be considered an establishment of religion, which is prohibited under the First Amendment. Despite that, the monument went up on March of 2012. And then, one year later, in 2013, a Baptist minister named Bruce Prescott, with the help of the American Civil Liberties Union, sued claiming that the monument was unlawful, to which the Oklahoma Supreme Court ultimately sided with him in 2015. However, that's not the part of the story that makes it interesting. You see, something very unusual happened during that same time. On November 17th, 2013, a group calling themselves the Satanic Temple submitted a proposal asking if they could construct a monument to Satan to accompany the Ten Commandments. The proposal's authors, founders Malcolm Jerry and Lucian Greaves, claimed that it would actually help bolster their legal case against claims that they were favoring one religion above all others. This proposal, unsurprisingly, was rejected by the legislators, claiming that the Ten Commandments and Christianity possessed special historical significance, while other religious symbols simply did not. Which doesn't really help their case, but also seems to reveal the true motivations of those who were involved. In his book Speak of the Devil, Laycock claims the longer the conversation about the Satanic Temple's monument went on, the more assumptions that had gone largely unstated began to bubble to the surface. In a moment of honesty that undermined claims that the Ten Commandments monument was not religious, Representative Earl Sears expressed his opinions that this is a faith-based nation and a faith-based state. Faith in this context was code for Protestantism symbolized by a monument with the Protestant version of the Ten Commandments. I think it is very offensive that they would contemplate or even have this kind of conversation. The fact that the conversation is deemed offensive is telling. It is not the statue itself, but the discussion of it that is disruptive because it unsettles assumptions. Just like with Dungeons and Dragons before it, something new and unknown prompts uncomfortable conversations, and thus, people seek to shut it down. The difference is that this one is so in your face and unabashedly what these people warn about that it makes it so uniquely interesting to look at. In a sense, the Satanic Temple is the other spiritual successor to the panic. But this time, instead of rehashing the same conspiracy theory in a slightly different coat of paint, this one seems effectively to exist to be these fears made manifest, to challenge the narrative in a different and more interesting way. So to start things off, these guys didn't invent Satanism, nor do they actually worship Satan. He's more of a symbol than an actual entity. Prior to them, there were groups like the Church of Satan, which was founded by Anton LaVey in the 1960s. And these two groups could not be any more different. LaVey's philosophy draws very heavily from Nietzsche's idea of the Ubermensch and the objectivist philosophy of Ayn Rand, and contains nine core concepts 
that all exist to be complete inversions of Christian ideas, unbridled pleasure-seeking, revenge, taking what is yours. Whereas the Satanic Temple puts forth seven tenets that focus more on things like compassion towards others, listening to evidence, and that people should have their basic freedoms respected, even if that makes you uncomfortable. The difference seems mostly to stem from the climate from which these two philosophies came to be. According to Laycock, this new brand of Satanism is being spearheaded by a generation that came of age during the Satanic Panic of the 1980s. The Church of Satan emerged in a decade when many Americans believed Christianity was dying out. By contrast, the new generation perceives core American values of tolerance and free inquiry as under assault by a radical Christian agenda. Satanism, the boogeyman presented to them in their youth, is now looked to as a weapon against their enemies and a symbolic expression of their anger. A lot of the activism that is pursued by the Satanic Temple seems to be centered around testing the supposed neutrality towards religion that is codified in U.S. law. As part of this, the term Lucian's Law has been coined after one of the founders, stating governments will either one, close open forms when the Satanic Temple asks to speak, or two, censor the Satanic Temple, thereby opening itself to legal liability. As a result of their actions, oftentimes what will happen is that governments and organizations will just simply shut down all religiously affiliated operations that are going on, rather than let a satanic organization take root. The thing that I find particularly interesting, and the reason that I wanted to end with mentioning them, is the fact that I unironically think many satanists, at least those who belong to the satanic temple, embody the values of Christ more than many of the Christians who sounded the alarm about Satanists originally in the 1980s. Unlike LeVay's concept of Satanism, which seeks to fully invert Christianity and feeds into a lot of the image of what a Satanist looks like to a Christian, the Satanic Temple chooses to invert not Christianity, but the Christian image of Satanists. By doing philanthropy, and calling their followers to treat others with compassion, the Satanic Temple is inverting the narrative as to what Satanists are like, robbing the charges of their power. As Laycock remarks, if Satan is the symbol that energizes the myth of America as a Christian nation, and grants moral license to act against the other, it is predictable that those on the losing end of this myth will seek to hijack it by appropriating Satan for their own ends. Further, the utility of Satan in constructing a countermyth is directly proportional to how vehemently Satan is deployed to dehumanize the other. It would seem that the tables have turned. After spending a lifetime of having your hobbies, or even your very sense of identity and sense of self constantly demonized, you wouldn't be surprised that people might want to fight back, to lean into the narrative, to say, your words mean nothing, because I challenge your assumption that the thing you accuse me of being is bad to begin with. So let's bring this full circle now, shall we? Is Pokemon satanic? In a sense, yeah, it is. The core values of the series are in line with the seven tenets, there's no real contradiction here, but in all seriousness, this whole story is insane. When I first set out to make this video a year ago, yes, I've been working on this a whole year almost, I planned on just finding some crazy televangelist and making fun of their arguments as being insane, a la H-Bomber guy or something along those lines. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized that I couldn't just do that. I needed to understand where this came from and what drives it. And along the way, I found a very interesting way to counter it. These talking points aren't going away anytime soon. It looks like Q is here to stay for the foreseeable future, and we literally have had a resurgence of classic satanic panic talking points earlier this year when rapper Lil Nas X released a music video where he, uh, how do I put this? Does very special favors for the devil before killing him and taking his place, and then followed it up by selling Nikes containing human blood. 
which led to legal action because he might have not gotten permission before using their trademark for that. Oops, it appears that Christians do still have some power in this nation. The little Nas case is very interesting to me because it embodies just about everything we've talked about this entire video. We have the case of where an artist who is part of a group that has been demonized for perceived deviance, namely the fact that not only is he gay, but very unapologetically open about it, who decided to stir a little bit of controversy by leaning into the fear-mongering about Satanists. In a defiant statement, one that says, you have no power over me. If you want to claim that I'm going to hell for simply being who I am, then sure, let's roll with it. I mean, it can't be much worse than the treatment that people like that receive on a daily basis already. In a sense, we're already in hell. Hell is other people, after all. And so if you're really threatening me with an eternity away from you, that sounds wonderful. All joking aside, we're in the midst of a cultural shift right now and it has people afraid. Narratives of Satan and Satanists have been used throughout history to condemn groups of people or behavior, be it for questioning the authority of religious figures or for simply existing in a world that does not want to tolerate you. In a deep irony, the true people to get lost in the fantasy, to fall from the grace of God, are not those who are accused of being evil but those doing the accusing. Using a narrative like this to other people is the most unchristian thing I can possibly imagine. God is dead, and we have killed him. In the absence of our divine creator, let us do what we can to honor his legacy by acting with love and compassion towards others. Happy Halloween, everybody.